This is Epicenter, episode 334 with guest Ryan Sean Adams. Hi, welcome to Epicenter. My name is Sebastian Cuccio. Today our guest is Ryan Sean Adams. Ryan is the founder of Mythos Capital. They're a crypto fund. They hold crypto assets, of course, and they also offer staking services to large stakeholders for the Cosmos and Loom networks. Ryan is also the author of a popular DeFi newsletter called Bankless. Now, if you're not a subscriber, I would encourage you to check it out. We'll leave the links in the show notes because it's one of the newsletters that takes a very practical approach to leveraging DeFi and becoming bankless, as he puts it. So he shares a lot of thoughts about the ecosystem, of course, but one of the things that I like the most about it are the actionable strategies that you can implement to improve your utilization of DeFi and you know even make money. Uh, he's also the host of the Bankless podcast, which was recently launched and that he hosts with David Hoffman, who was also recently on the podcast. So here's what you'll learn in this interview. Ryan's background as a tech entrepreneur and how he got involved in crypto, launching Mythos Capital and the thesis of his fund, why it's important to become bankless and being able to do money verbs like lending, spending, paying, etc. without banks, what good analogies we can use to describe DeFi, what good analogies we can use to describe DeFi to people who are not familiar with it, the power concentrated in centralized exchanges and whether or not that's a threat to DeFi, the trustless nature of Ethereum versus Bitcoin, Ether as a store of value asset in Ethereum, and the idea that ETH is money, the importance of self-reinforcing feedback loops in DeFi, the role of nation states in the future DeFi ecosystem, and of course, the effects of coronavirus on the world economy and crypto markets. So for the last two months, we've been running a survey on the podcast, and I wanted to extend my gratitude to everybody who participated in this survey. It was our first survey, and I wasn't really sure how it was going to turn out, but about 200 of you participated. So thanks a lot, because the insights that we learned here are extremely valuable. So I'll be writing a blog post this week and posting it to our Medium and also our blog on the website with some of the key insights here. So thanks to all of you, and thanks to Shapeshift for uh, offering to give keep keys to everybody who participated. I hope you guys are enjoying your keep keys. Now, I'm not one to watch a lot of TV. I don't have a TV. I don't usually have a Netflix account. But being in confinement these last couple of weeks, you got to occupy yourself. And so I started watching a few things. And, and last week, I binged watched the entire 10 episodes of the new Star Trek Picard series. I got so excited about this thing because when I was a kid, I was really into Star Trek. And so, of course, you can't have Jean-Luc Picard without the Borg, right? And so if you're not familiar with Star Trek, the Borg are the species that co-op technologies from other species, and they sort of assimilate those technologies within their own collective hive mindset. And they have this incredible ability to, to adapt whenever they were attacked. The first few would fall, but then they would always adapt. In fact, they would always say that. They would say, they've adapted, and then the good guys would have to change up their strategies. Well, I feel this is a great analogy for security in the blockchain space. Every time there's a hack or when a security vulnerability is discovered, we collectively adapt our strategies and our mindsets to improve our defenses. So I'd like to tell you about an event that will help upgrade your security mindset. The privacy-focused security consulting company, Least Authority, is hosting their first security sessions on April 30th. This is a free online meetup for blockchain founders and tech leads where you will learn about the low-hanging fruit common vulnerabilities that you can fix today, what security audits actually looked like from start to finish, and exciting developments in blockchain security research. You can ask questions to their team of expert security researchers and get advice about the things that you're most concerned about. And it's free. So once again, it's happening on April 30th, and there will be several sessions throughout the day to accommodate for all time zones. To sign up for this free event, go to leastauthority.com slash meetup. Be like the Borg and upgrade your security mindset. Once again, to sign up, go to leastauthority.com dot com slash meetup. And with that, 
Here is our conversation with Ryan Sean Adams. We're here with Ryan Sean Adams. Ryan Sean Adams is the founder of Mythos Capital and also uh, writes a pretty popular newsletter, I'd say, in the in the DeFi space called Bankless. And so we're going to talk with Ryan today about a number of things, but uh, primarily you know, DeFi, why it's important, and his thoughts on the long-term sustainability of DeFi. Ryan, thanks for joining us today. Oh, it's great to be with you guys. I love the podcast, so it's, it's fantastic to be on it. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to have you. So before we get started, get, tell us a bit about your background and how you came to be involved in the crypto space. Yeah, so my background is, you know, uh, tech entrepreneurship, kind of the Silicon Valley uh, track, um, had a healthcare startup that I was involved as, as kind of a co-founder of, um, sold that. And um, in 2013, really started to, you know, pop the lid on Bitcoin a bit. And, and this was through a, a, f- a friend of mine, actually, the, the co-founder of the company. He said that he was buying some ASICs to mine something called Bitcoin. And that sounded so weird and bizarre. I, I had to check it out. <laughs> so I remember one Thanksgiving weekend that year, I, I spent the entire weekend just absorbing everything I could. Andreas Antonopoulos talks, you know, mastering uh, Bitcoin books documentaries, everything I could get my hands on. And I remember finishing that weekend being like, wow, this is a game changer. Um, I, you know, I want to quit my job now and go into this. Um, I didn't. Cooler heads prevailed uh, on come Monday morning. Um, and I kind of went back to business as usual. I didn't get further involved in this space. But my round two in the crypto rabbit hole was really Ethereum. So Bitcoin was was really interesting, the things you could do with it and transferring cryptocurrency around. But for me, Ethereum was like the paradigm shift. And the reason I got into Ethereum was because of this aspect of programmable money. So not only can you move Ether from one place to another, you can create other assets on top of the Ethereum uh, economy. You can create money protocols. You can accomplish other things like lending and borrowing, you know, fundraising. Even the ICOs were sort of an early example of permissionless fundraising and programmable money around fundraising. So that was like the, you know, the, the second, I guess, one, two combo punch for me. And I was just, I was just gone. I couldn't think of anything else. Um, nothing else was as interesting to me. Uh, after that, um, you know, it's it just the combination of economics and finance and psychology and monetary history and technology, like it, it's all there. I realized that this is sort of the birth of uh, a new internet, kind of a, you know, once in a lifetime or generational type experience. I remember the early internet as a kid and, you know, playing around with that and how magical that was. Uh, and um, I decided I absolutely was not going to miss it miss this this revolution so i kind of went all in at that point from a career perspective do some crypto investing now uh, also have a staking company and um, this year i created a um, a newsletter program to explore the d5 space called bankless and uh, we're just helping people with with tactics and strategy how to think about crypto uh, and become more and more bankless because i think that is the promise of crypto and I bet we'll get into that in a bit more. But it's it's uh, not just Bitcoin; it's bankless, without a central bank, without a commercial bank, being able to do this on a peer to peer basis. That is the self sovereign money aspect of crypto, and that's why this space is uh, incredibly interesting. At least to me, that's why I'm here. I'm curious if you can dive into it, this a little bit more. You know, you discovered Bitcoin first and then sort of didn't fully fall down the rabbit hole but kind of like partially and then afterwards he did so why do you think like what was it about ethereum that that second time like really fully caught you i think something just kind of clicked for me really the second go around with ethereum it was um, a much more expressive platform so you could create other assets on top of it. You know, that was kind of the uh, initial use case that was incredibly interesting. So with Bitcoin, it's sort of this mono asset platform where you only kind of have Bitcoin, at least in a trustless, in a trustless way. With Ethereum, the ability to create all of these assets 
Um, even something early on with Ethereum, like like t- the tokenized gold, you know, with, with uh, the Digex platform. Um, how interesting is that? Um, or the Augur platform was kind of an early Ethereum project uh, with prediction markets and being able to create sort of this this idea of an oracle. Um, it was it was that programmability that I think felt to me a lot more like the early internet. And the early internet I see as, um, and the internet today is it's it's really a permissionless communication protocol. So anybody can create a website. Um, you don't have to ask Google or or Facebook. You know, you just you know, create a website. Anyone can send an email using protocols like SMTP and and POP. Um, you don't have to ask permission to do that. And the applications you can build around that. Um, I mean, we've seen that play out over the over the last couple of decades. So it was this expressivity in Ethereum that kind of drew me in that in that second round, and I thought, wow, this is this is like the internet. This is like a, a new set of protocols for uh, digital scarcity and for value transfer, and uh, the permissionless aspect of Ethereum, the ability to program things on top of it. That's like the early internet, and that could lead to kind of a this this massive second wave of of innovation. And so, you know, after I kind of figured that out, you know, that was kind of it for me. I, I will say a little bit after that, I probably round tripped on Bitcoin a little bit and rediscovered the the value of um, store of valueness and you know, kind of monetary premium inherent in the Bitcoin asset. And you know, that that kind of reinvigorated uh, uh, some excitement for for Bitcoin for me too, uh, and and it helped kind of inform. The, the model and the thesis uh, I, I, I use for these assets today, the programmability and expressivity of Ethereum and its economy uh, as a money platform, and also um, some of the, the monetary premium aspects of, of Bitcoin, both of those things I think are really important in a bankless system. Given this, this sort of personal thesis around crypto, can you tell us a bit more about Mythos Capital and how that how your personal convictions sort of flow into the investment thesis here and what you're doing at Mythos. Yeah. So in, in 2017, I think, you know, I was, I was so excited about this space and I wasn't the only one to obviously think this. The first thing I wanted to do is like, um, you know, I should go start a hedge fund, right? <laughs> um, that's what everyone's doing. Go start a hedge fund. That's a way to kind of invest in the space and, and uh, partake in the space. But what I realized about the kind of the, the hedge fund model is it's not, uh, it doesn't kind of suit my strengths or, or sort of my, my thesis for the world. So the, the hedge fund model, of course, you pool assets from other investors and um, you get paid uh, 20% annual, 2%, 3% you know, performance, something like that. And you know, your re- returns are really measured on a monthly, quarterly, annual basis. I don't think monthly, quarterly, annual is the the best uh, time horizon, at least for me, in thinking about crypto monies as a narrative. Uh, what it what it tends to foster is, is hedge funds that that um, do what I call narrative investing rather than more fundamentals, long term investing. So the narrative investing is like, well, you know, staking is so hot this year, so we're going to buy a bunch of staking assets, or you know. Initial exchange offerings is so hot right now. We're going to do that. Or exchange tokens, they're the thing. And it keeps you kind of moving around from gain to gain. And that, that's fine. It's just not what I wanted to do. What I found is there were just, a, if you look at the coin a market cap top 100, there are just a couple of assets, you know, maybe a ha- handful that I felt excited about uh, that I felt would be able to accrue and maintain a monetary premium. And if I'm just holding, you know, assets like Ether and assets like Bitcoin uh, for investors. Well, it, it makes no sense to charge investors, you know, two and twenty percent just to just to do that. They can go do that themselves. So I canned the the hedge fund idea, have kind of a you know a, a smaller capital pool of some private investors where we're just kind of investing for the long term. And primarily the thesis is crypto money type assets, so like Bitcoin and Ether. We've got also some, some stuff going in sort of the, the staking world as well with a couple of assets that we, we don't think will accrue monetary premium, but are nonetheless um, somewhat interesting. So a little bit there. 
And then really what I decided to spend most of my time on is kind of the the long-term uh, development of a community that's going on the same journey that that I'm going on, which is the the journey to become more bankless. So essentially to take these crypto money systems that we have, Ether, Bitcoin, and all of the protocols built on top of them, and uh, then start using them, start using them in place of our bank accounts. So your Bank of America, your Wells Fargo account, uh, the thesis is those will become less and less necessary over time. And your crypto accounts, your Ether address, your, your Bitcoin uh, wallet, those will become more and more valuable over time. And there might come a time and place where, you know, first your net worth shifts to, to more crypto assets uh, rather than traditional assets. And for some people that's already happened. And then the second wave is, you know, the, the activity, their account activity, their, their banking activity switches from uh, their Wells Fargo bank account to their Ethereum address. You know, and that to me is a vision worth striving for, uh, something I'm passionate about and uh, I think has a really interesting upside, monetary accrual type of uh, value proposition. So it just, it just checks all the boxes for me. Why is it important to become bankless? Yeah, so I think that um, the reason it's important to become bankless is because over the last 100, you know, 200 years, and now I, I think the pace is accelerating, a lot of the sovereignty that individuals have had uh, has started to disappear. It seems to me when you kind of look across the world that we're moving in a direction of uh, more authoritarian regimes, more totalitarian type control, less individual decision making, and more decision making by the few who control the lives of, of the many. And I actually think that the you know, advent of uh, technologies, like not the internet, not the base internet protocols, but the tech giants that have built on top of those platforms are not helping us. They are causing more centralization. It shouldn't be the case that a government can control an individual's economic activity, shut off access to their bank accounts, you know, inflate the, the value of their assets. Essentially, that's a, that's a, a power that the few shouldn't have. It gives, it gives governments too much power, the ability to you know, label you as a dissident and lock you out of the, the global economic system. And I think that that is an unhealthy balance uh, so in some ways, we're in precarious times and we're moving more towards more, you know, more greater control of the few and in more precarious times. So to me, the, the movement is about decentralization. And what I mean by decentralization is you know, changing the structure of power from the few, taking some power from the few and distributing it to the many. And so I think a, a self-sovereign money system that includes not only a money that's not state, state backed at the, at the base layer, but also a banking system on top of that, that is permissionless, that is available to you know, the 4.5 mil- billion people across the world with an internet connection that can't be turned off by governments across the world, that is accessible to all, uh, that anyone can build on top of, that to me is a worthwhile and important project in these precarious times. Yeah, no, absolutely. Couldn't agree more with this. And so when you look at DeFi, is that, like, how would you describe DeFi? Or how do you describe DeFi to people who are kind of like, you know, new to this thing? Maybe they've heard of Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, but they don't have a conception of DeFi. Like, how, how do you describe it? So I, li- I like to use analogies because the problem is when we're talking about um, DeFi, the people in this space, we, we go into this like, you know, word salad of things that just no one understands. You know, I'm going to take my die and I'm going to put it in the DSR and I'm going to get chai out of it. And then I'm going to zap into, you know, synthetics and I'm going to zap out. Like, it's, 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 it sounds crazy. I mean, to, to, to some of your listeners, this might sound normal because, because they're doing these sorts of things, but that, that's not the way to explain it uh, to the mainstream. So you know, the way I like to explain it is, you know, first of all, 
we've got a, a traditional system, traditional money system on the left, right? That, that's everything we use today. So we have fiat money, that's the base layer money, and then we have the banking system, right? That's the um, the Wells Fargo's of the world, the Bank of America's, the HSBC's, right? And and together, um, though that's the money platform that we use today, and it allows us to do do things with our money, do finance, so things that are important like paying and you know spending and borrowing and lending longing and shorting, all of those things happen in the traditional world today. Well, crypto, and this is, you know, even broader than DeFi, but, but crypto is this parallel universe, right? So it operates in this, in this kind of separate uh, area. You have exchanges like Coinbase that serve as a bridge. So they will help you convert your traditional money over to this new money system. They're like a bridge for that. But once you're in this new money system, you're, you're kind of there. And it, it, it looks similar to the old money system in that there's a base layer instead of fiat currency like U.S. dollars or the euro. Um, that base layer is crypto money systems. And when I say crypto money, people always get tripped up by the word money. I just mean assets that are a store of value used as collateral, reserve assets for the crypto ecosystem. And Bitcoin has been and is one of those. Um, Ether, I think, is is one of those too, and is emerging as a kind of a DeFi reserve asset, if you will. But that's the bottom layer. So that's like fiat, right? The base money crypto layer, it's different than fiat because issuance is trustless. So we don't have to trust you know, 12 people at the Federal Reserve to make decisions. Uh, we've got algorithms that make those decisions and uh, issuance decisions, uh, if you will. And those algorithms are, are really difficult to change. It requires um, lots of social consensus. So it's, um, it's a better money system from, from that perspective. Now, it's much more volatile. So you know, people get tripped up when you call it money. But we could talk about that more. But so, so you've got this base money layer, these reserve assets like Bitcoin and Ether on the other side in this new world. And then above that, you've got the, the crypto banks, as I call them. So sort of the, the exchanges. And you also have the DeFi protocols. So that's the banking layer. So those, that, those are our equivalents to Wells Fargo and Bank of America. And so if it's a, if it's a crypto bank, um, it, it does have an element of, of centralization, of course. It's more similar to Wells Fargo. So you know, Coinbase is set up as a, as a corporate entity, um, but Coinbase allows you to do things with your crypto money. Uh, it allows you to accept it in Coinbase Commerce. So you could you put a plugin on a website and start accepting DAI and, and Ether. Uh, it, it allows you to um, trade. It allows you to borrow and lend. These exchanges will become more and more like, like banks over time. But then you also have this really interesting new set of protocols that are generally built on top of Ethereum. And these are the DeFi protocols, the money protocols, if you will. And these are really interesting because they allow you to accomplish those money verbs, the borrowing and the, and the lending and the trading. They allow you to start doing those things without a bank in between, right? So with Uniswap, for instance, it's just you and a protocol. You don't give up your private keys. You still maintain control of your, your crypto money. There's, there's no one in the middle. It's just code. That's the purest form of a DeFi protocol, like, you know, the highly, highly trustless. And now with Uniswap, you can start trading without anybody in between, right? Um, that is a, a fully bankless system. And as those money protocols develop more and more, you know, we'll have a completely parallel system, I think, that replicates the traditional system but has one key advantage. That advantage is it's, it's trustless. So it's trustlessly settled and our crypto money is, is trust, trustlessly issued and we can, we can go fully bankless. So with your Ethereum account, um, your Ethereum address, which anyone can access, anyone can open, there's no restrictions, it's not, it's not censorable, you have a passport to this parallel system. And that to me is what it means to, to uh, go fully bankless and that to me is, is the vision of, of DeFi. It's an extension of the original crypto vision that I feel like at times, you know, the Bitcoin maximalist community has, has forgotten. Like that the point of this whole thing is to go bankless. It's not to replace, you know, the traditional bankers with a, a new set of like Binance and 
Coinbase and you know new banking overlords. The point of this is complete self-sovereign money and a completely self-sovereign parallel financial system. And DeFi plays a key role in that, in my mind. Maybe just briefly on that. So, I, I mean, I agree with this, that this is a desirable outcome. At the same time, it seems like what we've, you know, what we've seen in the last years is that exchanges have become increasingly powerful. They are doing more and more different things. For example, we had um, Jesse Powell from Kraken on a while ago, you know, he was talking about, okay, the idea, like the, the, the advantage of an exchange that, you know, if you trade on the exchange and if they also offer derivatives, you can use like, you know, your balance in the spot trade to like as margin for derivatives. And, you know, then exchanges offering staking, exchanges offering lending, you know, there's ideas of some of the exchanges to go into trading other assets like stocks and stuff like that. So do you think this is going to happen in terms that, or like uh, what, what are going to be the drivers that actually make this a sort of self-sovereign money? You know, I manage my own assets as opposed to, you know, just a new set of basically large financial institutions. I totally agree. That's the direction it's going, right? Or, or it might go. And I think the answer to your question is DeFi. That's why I'm so excited about it. It's, it's, it's DeFi, it's money protocols rather than crypto banks. We want protocols, not banks. So what's, what's happening, as you say, is, is Kraken is becoming our new JP Morgan, right? And Binance is becoming our new Goldman Sachs. Um, <laughs> and what, what, what alarms me somewhat is that I don't want to characterize or stereotype the Bitcoin community, but certainly among Bitcoin maximalists, th they seem totally fine with that. <laughs> Some of them do. What they want to do, what many of them want to do is usher in a, uh, a new gold standard, right? Where, where Bitcoin is kind of, you know, the Bitcoin standard. Um, but the problem with the Bitcoin network is it's not expressive enough to contain an entire trustless financial system. So with Bitcoin, there's one thing you can do on Bitcoin trustlessly, uh, and you can only do it at three to four transactions per second. And that's move Bitcoin from one place to another. That's the thing you do. That's the verb you can accomplish. You can pay someone. You can receive Bitcoin. That's it. It's not expressive enough to create an entire trustless banking layer on top of it. And so what happens is due to this limitation, I feel like the Bitcoin community has somewhat said, well, you know, who, who needs all this DeFi stuff anyway, right? We have Kraken, Coinbase, and you know, we don't need high transactions per second on the base layer anyway. This is all about, you know, even, even Safadine in, in his book, The Bitcoin Standard, he's like, I'd be fine with a world where there's, you know, thousand maybe different crypto banks settling on the Bitcoin main chain and individuals really don't do it day to day. Well, like, I mean, that's not compelling to me. That means we're, we're all, you know, kind of keeping we're using crypto banks for all of the, the money verbs and they become our new banking overlords. And so maybe that serves to make original Bitcoin holders rich, but it, it, doesn't, it doesn't lead to a completely self-sovereign money system, right? Because the thing you have to realize is that, you know, in the traditional world, it works the same way. The central banks and uh, the banking structure, they're, they're all part of the, the same apparatus, right? you know, the, the banking structure in the US, they're, they're kind of an extension of, of the Fed. So the central banks, you know, sets the, the monetary policy, sets the interest rate, all of these things, and commercial banks essentially carry it out. If the Fed requires something, commercial banks do it. They are nodes on the Fed's network, right? So unless you disrupt and have replacements for b both of those things, it, it's just going to re-centralize on the banking layer. So to me, that limited Bitcoin vision is not at all compelling. What is compelling is having money protocols actually compete on the banking layer in Ethereum, for example. And, you know, a, a world where Uniswap is bigger in terms of liquidity pool than Binance and Coinbase, you know, maybe not Uniswap, maybe a protocol like it, something that is completely permissionless and trustless. That's the world I want to see. And I think that's the world of, of the original crypto vision. So it's about these protocols getting stronger and even starting to disrupt uh, some of the banks. And I think what will happen 
is this. I read a post on Bankless recently called the Great Protocol Sync, which is in this, this gives me hope because it seems right now that the exchanges and the crypto banks, they, they will kind of control this banking layer. But what I think could happen is protocols could kind of drop, drop below and the crypto banks might start serving as onboarding for these DeFi protocols. So you already saw Qcoin, which is a, you know, exchange in Asia, uh, they're incorporating the die savings rate into into their accounts, so you can deposit directly into the die savings rate. So, DeFi protocol has kind of slipped under underneath uh, a crypto bank in that case, right? Well, how long until crypto banks start tapping into the liquidity reserves of Uniswap? Hopefully, hopefully that might come soon. I made the prediction. I I, I think a top three exchange will incorporate the die savings rate into its platform sometime this year. And once one does, then they all will. So that is my that is kind of the great hope, the great protocol sync is that some of these DeFi protocols start to become so credibly neutral and start to acquire enough state to actually be used by these crypto banks the same way the crypto banks are using uh, crypto money protocols like Bitcoin and Ether. That's the hope. Yeah, no, so I love that you bring this up because this is a topic that you know, at course one, we've spent tons of time working on and especially around the topic of proof of stake, right? Because in proof of stake, you have now many exchanges supporting staking and they can kind of do DeFi like things where let's say you can stake and you can maybe lend the money at the same time, or you can still trade. And it's actually, it's more powerful than, than if you kind of custody the asset on your own. So we've been doing work and there's currently kind of a working group that we've been running on this topic that's been funded from the Interchain Foundation around how you can basically kind of bring DeFi to proof of stake protocols so that you could do those things in a decentralized way. Right? So you don't have to give up custody of assets. And I totally agree. I think it's a super important thing. It's actually especially around proof of stake, because if you have the proof of stake assets all, all mostly controlled by exchanges, and then those assets also become kind of the deciding things around uh, consensus. It means really they, they control the chains in a way that they don't control Bitcoin. You know, even if like 50% of Bitcoin are held on a bunch of exchanges, they can't really 51% attack Bitcoin because it's a separate thing. But with, with proof of stake, they kind of can. So I think it's a super important topic. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think DeFi needs a lot more innovation around what you're talking about, you know, creating staking assets that are useful in a permissionless way. If DeFi doesn't do this, and if these money protocols don't become competitive, and let's talk about the third element is if consumers just don't care about going, you know, uh, f fully trustless, and then I think the, the crypto banks will sort of win. Um, yeah, you know, in the staking business with with Mythos, uh, we participate in a network called Loom. There's like something like 300 million or something Loom staked. Binance just launched a couple months ago on that network. They now have 153 million, or you know, like it's over 50 percent. That can easily happen to crypto networks, and particularly in staking. And I think the great defense that that money protocols need to have is, is to be incredibly useful and ultimately uh, to have liquidity. Liquidity pools are the hedge against um, crypto banks kind of running the entire crypto economy, which uh, not a lot of people are talking about, to be honest, right now. And I think, I think we should be. There's a lot to unpack here, but I'd like to come back on a couple of things you said. As we're recording this, I just, I just came back from um, ETCC. Uh, actually, it was happening here in town, but I heard a couple people say there that in the DeFi space, well, what people really care about and what people are really passionate about is the ability to to sort of create money Legos in a permissionless way, right? If you know how to smart, if you know how to code Solidity, if you know how to code a smart contract, like you can create new types of financial vehicles and um, new money Legos, and and the composability of those different parts, right? So you talked about DeFi app earlier, but that in the end. You know, trustlessness, as as interesting as it is, like some some people probably are fully aware that we're not going to go fully trustless, or maybe have resigned them themselves to that fact. So, like you were talking earlier about exchanges capturing 
you know, the majority of the liquidity in, in the networks and consumers need to care about that. Well, like consumers are fully are perfectly fine with putting most of their information on Facebook or on medium or whatever, but their ability to create content there just at will and express themselves and talk about whatever they want is really what they care about. So, you know, sort of overlapping the DeFi analogy to the internet of information analogy. Do you think that it's possible that it just ends up going in a, in a direction where you know, we have the ability to create all of these interesting financial products, but that the underlying networks themselves are not fully trustless? Yeah. So maybe I'll say two things on that. So the first is I'm not on a crusade against the crypto banks, right? So that, you know, I think crypto banks are incredibly useful. Coinbase has done so much for this space. It's, it's incredible. Bringing fiat over, making crypto usable, tapping into Bitcoin, Ether, and other crypto assets as a money protocol to enable exchanging, to enable lending, trading, all of these things, massively useful. You know, love crypto banks from that vantage point. Don't want us to be limited to buy them. But the, the thing that makes, I think, crypto protocols and protocols in general, Ethereum, of course, as well, it's, it, the thing that makes it so special is that it's permissionless. So anyone can build anything on it. I think that stable coins, bank stable coins, are a brilliant use case for crypto. That's not completely trustless at all, but it allows you to move trusted US dollars using USDC across the world in a matter of seconds, you know, billions worth for transaction fees that cost cents. That's magic, right? And of course, Ethereum as a platform can't say no to that use case and doesn't say no, uh, wouldn't, he, wouldn't want to. So all that to say, I actually... I, you know, I, I say DeFi and I use the meme, but it's with like reservation and with objection because I don't actually love the, the term DeFi. I like the term open finance better because this is a lot like the internet. No, you know, no one can stop you from publishing a blog or uploading a, a video or creating a, a website. Um, it's permissionless like the internet. It's open like the internet. That I think is is the true potential. Anyone can build on top of it. You can build a, a trusted money application. You can build a trustless money application. So I don't think everything in on Ethereum needs to be fully trustless uh, or fully DeFi. I think there's a spectrum. You know, on the on the one hand, that you know, totally decentralized money protocol left probably the the best case of that is Uniswap, right? But then we get things that are more and more trusted all the way to the other side of that where you get something like tokenized securities. And that's just a token representation of something that, that settles in legal meat space. But even that is, is highly useful. So it's about permissionless, not decentralized. It's about uh, open finance, I think. But the, the second thing I would say to, to your point about, hey, look, consumers don't care. I mean, they're happy to lend on uh, Coinbase and or DeFi, whichever is easier, right? And wherever they can get the the best uh, return and the most liquidity, right? You know, I tend to agree with that. I don't think consumers care, but I will tell you another party that cares. Um, if you think about like groups of people who care a bit more broadly, the, the crypto banks care about what protocols they built on. So I don't think that Coinbase is going to be very excited about uh, building on top of Binance Chain with BNB as the reserve asset, that's Binance's token, right? Why? Because, you know, that entire Binance economy is, is, uh, is tilted in, in favor of, of Binance, right? It's kind of their system. It's the same reason, you know, China is, is not really excited to build on a protocol that's controlled by the US, right? You know, they, they'd like to establish their own money protocols and have dominance over their own money protocols. So, Kind of, I guess all this goes to the, the thesis that the credible neutrality of a protocol is what, what really matters when you talk about these, these large consumer groups like, like banks and potentially countries. You know, China would never build on a crypto network that was controlled by the U.S. government. Would they build on Ethereum? Well, maybe if they think it's, it's credibly neutral, if they think that um, it's a fair system, maybe they would. Coinbase would never hold or, or build massive trading pairs on BNB. 
that's the Binance coin. But would they on Bitcoin? Yeah, of course. They've, they've done that before and they will continue. Will they on, on Ether? Yes. So what I'm saying is maybe individual consumers don't care as much. You know, that would be the more pessimistic view. And I'm, I'm inclined to agree. But large consumer groups like nation states and like other crypto banks care about the credible neutrality of the underlying protocol. And they're going to build on protocols that aren't tilted in someone's favor, that aren't centralized, that are maximally decentralized. So that I think is the bull case for, for money protocols and why they, why they kind of sink to the bottom just naturally. And we're seeing money protocols do that. We're seeing Bitcoin kind of sink to the bottom, continue to accrue value. We're seeing that happen with Ethereum. It's the most credibly neutral protocols that end up winning. Let's imagine a future where you know, Ethereum and DeFi in general you know, have grown to several hundreds of billions of dollars of locked value and massive economies built on top of these platforms. What role do you see central banks having and by extension of nation state money, what role do you see that having in the broader DeFi ecosystem as it continues to grow? I'm not one who believes that you know, central banks or nation state powers will evaporate overnight or even in decades, nor am I one to believe that's, that's even like would be a good thing. The whole citadel view of the world where the world goes to hell, but you know, some people construct citadels to survive Armageddon. That's not enticing. I hope that doesn't happen. And I actually don't think it will. I think central banks and nation states will continue to play an important role in the future. But I do think that as the world develops a digital alternative, because we've had a physical alternative, we've had physical alternatives to fiat money before in the form of like gold and, and commodity assets like that. But crypto is the first time we've had a digital alternative to uh, centrally backed digital US dollars. As we have an alternative, and if the old system, the traditional system, makes missteps, mistakes, abuses their trust, doesn't innovate fast enough, well, more of that trust and more of that monetary premium and more of the value will flow from the traditional world to the new crypto world over time. And I think that that's the, the crypto bet that anyone who's invested in crypto assets is at least monetary crypto assets. That's the bet that they're making that funds and capital will flow from this old traditional world to this new traditional world. It, it could take decades. It might take generations, but you know, future generations will have an alternative to the traditional system. And um, hopefully that restores a bit more balance. Uh, we have a, a backup system to the traditional central banks and, and fiat system. And we can use that bank backup system if things go wrong. And that backup system has some really nice perks. Anyone with an internet connection can access it. No one can stop you from moving funds or, or going bankless on it. So it's, it's a nice system to have in place as a check on central powers and to use if uh, central powers, again, just don't innovate and um, increasingly interfere with a lot in an unfair way with the lives of their citizens. I would love to touch a little bit on this topic, if is money. I know there's been kind of a raging debate uh, going on in that, or maybe that's slightly exaggerated, but like a, a lot of discussion about that in the Ethereum community, where I think some people strongly like this notion, and uh, you're one of them, and some, you know, are very much against it. I probably flat Sam fear the one that comes most to mind. But what do you mean when you say ETH is money? How do you define money, and how does ETH kind of fit in this context? I'm definitely a proponent of, of the view that ETH is money. I think it's absolutely essential for to have a bankless financial system, to have a bankless store of value at the base layer. I think that ETH as a store of value asset in Ethereum is probably the most important or money Lego in the entire stack is that, that store of value. It collateralizes loans. It provides liquidity for trading pairs and protocols like Uniswap. It's the backing for entire permissionless stable coins like DAI. So it's vital. It's, it's essential. Um, so I guess the, the opposing view on the like ETH is not money uh, camp, like I don't understand how Ethereum works or even matters 
as a global economic open finance system unless ETH is money. I haven't heard that case yet. People do get tripped up on the word money. And I totally understand that because there's a classical definition of, of money that economists use. It's a store of value. So that means you, you put your, your future value in it. It's a medium of exchange. So you can pay vendors with it. You can buy your, your coffee at Starbucks with it. And it's a unit of account. So things are priced in Ether. And Ether certainly is not all three of those things yet. Now, it is three of those things in, in some small ways inside of its own economy. So within the borders of Ethereum, the digital nation state and the digital economy, I would argue Ether is used as money across all three of those dimensions. But even in the Ethereum economy, there are better monies in some ways if, if you're using that, you know, it's got to be all three things definition, like DAI is a better money than Ether when it comes to being a better unit of account and being a better store of value in the short run and also a medium of exchange. I like to spend DAI, I don't like to spend Ether. But even DAI itself is only possible because Ether is a highly liquid monetary asset. And you can see this fairly easily, right? So there's about 100 million uh, DAI today. You just ask yourself the question, well, if we were trying to get to 100 billion DAI or a trillion DAI, what would that take? And if you were to do it in a permissionless way, one that doesn't depend on tokenized assets that are settled in meat space in the legal system, well, it would depend on a term I, I used to describe it, the economic bandwidth of assets like Ether inside of Ethereum to back that DAI. So to get DAI to a trillion, you have to have multiple trillions worth of ETH in value if ETH is going to be the thing that backs DAI moving forward. By ETH is money, what I generally mean when I say it is ETH is a reserve asset. ETH is an asset that has monetary premium that people choose to store, that is used as collateral, uh, that is used as a trading pair inside of the Ethereum economy. So it seems to me like it's actually, if you use that definition, you know, people are like, well, yeah, yeah, of course it's, it's money, or at least some people think it's money. And the thing with money is it's a social coordination mechanism. What is money? Well, money is the thing that people agree is money, right? It has been various things throughout history. And the more people who believe ETH is money and partake in a bankless uh, system and use ETH as money to lend, to borrow against, to transfer all of these things, the more it actually becomes money. So it's this kind of you know, feedback loop, self-reinforcing feedback loop. And I think that's happening with ETH. I think that's happening with Bitcoin. I would say Bitcoin is money too watching to see if it starts happening with other crypto assets. Haven't really seen it yet, but that's what ETH is money means, at least to me. I have not been extremely supportive of the idea that ETH is money because the claim that people make that ETH is money, when they make the claim, it's like this fait accompli, right? It's like, it's money because it has all these properties when in fact, you know, it doesn't have all the properties of money. And even if it did, it has the properties of money for a very small portion of people, right? You said that money is about social consensus. Well, the social, broad social consensus of like the majority of the world's population, or even just like the population of a country, isn't that ETH is money. And so like, there's still a long ways to go before we can get to the social consensus that ETH is money and get past the fact that it doesn't necessarily fully align with the definition of what is money. And this is something I want to talk about earlier is like, when trying to apply you know, analogies to crypto, it might be helpful generally as a space, I think we should be trying to find new terms to qualify what these things are. You know, just like, you know, with sort of previous waves of innovation, let's just say like the internet and, and publishing and information, you know, the spread of information, we found new terms. Like we don't use the same terminology as we did before because that old terminology doesn't apply anymore. We just found words that we find, you know, more accurately describe what we're trying to convey as an idea. And so similarly with ETH is money, I think it's misleading and confusing to some people, maybe on the periphery of the space to say that it's money. I agree with that. I, so one thing I would say is if you think of money as an adjective, right? So, you know, different assets have different degrees of moneyness. So ETH has some degree of moneyness. It has more moneyness than rep tokens from Augur. It probably has less moneyness than Bitcoin, right? It has less liquidity. It both those assets certainly have less moneyness than the US dollar, but they're somewhere on the spectrum of moneyness. 
and ETH is money is, is saying like, well, ETH is somewhere on the spectrum of moneyness and that moneyness is likely to, to increase. But, you know, I would ask if, if you feel like, um, would you say, Sebastian, that like, is DAI money? Is, is that a closer definition to you than if you said ETH was money? Maybe. I mean, perhaps, you know, it, it does have more stability than ETH, for instance, which is like a property that one wants in money. But the ability to spend DAI, right, like which is another property of money, the ability to exchange it for goods and services, much like Ether, is still fairly inexistent. And so from those perspectives, like for me, ETH or even Bitcoin to that extent, like maybe Bitcoin has a little bit more money because I can spend it more easily than Ether, but not that much more. Again, we're seeing the spectrum, right? All these assets exist on a spectrum of moneyness. You know, when I say Ether is money or when I think of an asset like DAI, DAI is essentially just stabilized ETH, right? So when you're spending DAI, you're spending 98% ETH. So that's kind of spending ETH or the value of ETH as money. And I do think that when you make the transition from that old universe on the left, the traditional financial system, right, where everything is trusted, to this new universe on the right, crypto system, where we've got a trustless money system, trustless financial system. Well, in this new system, what else are the monies? It's not USDC. That's not trustless. So if we're narrowing it down to what are the trustless monies? Well, it's you know Bitcoin, ETH, and DAI. I don't know, to your point about using another term, I don't know uh, what other term we'd use. I would be more supportive of, of analogies to help people understand the space and introduce them to the space, like skeuomorphisms, right? So when you, in the early days of operating systems, using terms like a file system or using you know, terms like Windows, helps people understand a graphical user interface. I feel like we're kind of doing the same thing here with terms like wallets and terms like vaults in terms like money. It's possible also that just the term money loses some of its, maybe the term gets diluted a little bit, similarly to the idea of news, right? Like 50 years ago, the concept of news had a lot more weight and gravity to it than it does now. You know, you say news, well, what does that mean? Are you talking about like your evening news or, you know, the New York Times writing a story about something or like something that you read on, on, on some blog with no references or like no reputation. But that still doesn't discount the fact that people still get confused about what is news and like people will give the same weight, I guess, to the credibility to both of those things when they make two things that might be two different things. I get a portion of my news from Reddit, you know, and my parents think that's crazy, but I call that news. They would not call that news, <laughs> right? <laughs> to your point. So we've kind of broadened the, the definition of what news is, or at least some of us have. And I think it's helpful to broaden the definition of what money is. But if that definition does not work for you, I would say, look, man, ignore the meme, <laughs> throw it out. You can substitute it with um, a reserve asset if you want. Some people, when they hear that, okay, well, you know, ETH isn't money, but yeah, I could see it being a reserve asset for DeFi. It's obviously used as collateral. Um, it's obviously used as economic bandwidth. And that might be more helpful for some. You got to kind of pick the meme that you most re resonate with, I think. We had Gabe Shapiro on recently and like he said something with which really resonated with me and that is really accurate is that most people in the space who hold crypto behind all of the ideological uh, memes and ethos money, etc., are holding crypto as investments and like they're waiting for those investments to go up in value. And if we can all just be comfortable with that, then maybe we can use terms that really do kind of resonate with what we really see these things to be, right? And instead of being kind of, I don't want to say dishonest about it, because I don't think it's dishonest, but misleading what we think these certain things are. Well, one term I like, if you're thinking about new terms, is the term economic bandwidth to describe these reserve assets like Ether and like Bitcoin. So the idea is just as we have, you know, internet bandwidth and, you know, if you had a 56K modem, you know, there's not enough bandwidth to load today's websites and you know today's internet so you need you need broadband you need faster connections essentially you can download get more data with a faster connection i don't think we should shy away from the fact that the value of these assets like bitcoin and ether are the economic bandwidth constraints for the value of trustless things we can put on top of them right so back to that die thought exercise DAI is not very interesting as a, as a $100 million asset. It's really interesting 
as a trillion dollar asset that all of the world needs. And what does it take to become a trillion dollar asset in a permissionless way? Well, the economic value, the trustless economic value of Ethereum or any system dies based on has to increase to meet that need. Otherwise, we're constrained. We're bandwidth constrained. We don't have enough economic bandwidth to grow DAI in a trustless way. We'd have to you know, take other assets like tokenized T-bills or tokenized gold, which again, settle in meat space and aren't trustless uh, and use that as bandwidth. And that is not trustless economic bandwidth. That at least has helped me define it a little bit more and, and understand it is this idea that you know, the value of ETH, the value of Bitcoin, those things are limiters, capacity limiters for the growth of, of DeFi and even the growth of, of crypto in general. So this whole speculation thing that we're doing in buying these crypto money assets at the base layer, we could be honest about that. That's what we're doing. I mean, I think this whole crypto money system is interesting because it has massive upside on the base layer. And if we're right, if the world becomes more and more bankless, then these assets will appreciate. And as they appreciate, they provide more economic bandwidth to make the system bigger and onboard more people. That's what makes this space so interesting. Let's go to the last topic that we want to talk about. So we're recording this right on Monday, March 9th. And for anyone who doesn't live under a rock, they're probably, you know, now aware of COVID-19 and sort of the whole virus that's spreading very rapidly in uh, all over the place now. And, you know, we've had some crypto downturn. I mean, we're also going to do a, a full episode on this topic soon. So we don't want to go too much into uh, sort of the health implications and stuff like that. All listeners who haven't really looked into that, do your research. It's, I, think, I think it's a very important topic to be on top of. But let's talk especially in this context here about, you know, what this means for the crypto markets, the crypto industry, you know, both in the short and in the long term. What's your take on this? What do you think? I'm going to give you one guy's take and one guy's you know, thoughts on it as they are now, such as they are now and subject to change. So Ryan Selkis wrote a really great piece this morning, actually, I just read called um, Rip Good Times, Rest in Peace Good Times. <laughs> And uh, you know that post kind of goes about how you'd expect it from the title, where he walks through sort of coronavirus and its potential implications in the U.S. and economics and, and healthcare-wise. And I, I think it's a great read. I'm going to be publishing a post on Bankless today. I just got to write it first. Called "Don't Panic, Position Yourself." I do think that coronavirus, there's a non-zero probability, and it's an increasing probability, could be the catalyst for a paradigm shift that Ray Dalio, a famous investor, has, has kind of written about 2020s will uh, be a lot different than the 2010s. And you know the way it could happen is coronavirus is, is kind of underestimated, I think, in the economy. It's a non-real chance that, that it is anyway. All of this could, could fade out, of course, but let's say it doesn't. And let's put those odds at maybe 30% right now. I would disagree with that assessment, but... Yeah, more than that. Let's say bad stuff happens in the US and uh, supply chains freeze, people can't go to work. That's obviously going to cause recession, probably global recession, economic downturn. And what's going to happen, what's going to need to happen is the Fed is going to bring rates to 0%, maybe negative territory, as in some uh, European countries, but there's not much room to move there. And then, you know, w once you've done that, you're trying to solve a problem that's not a monetary problem with monetary tools. Once you do that, then what do you do? Well, that's where you start injecting stimulus packages into the U.S. economy. Maybe you funnel that into the kind of the travel industry or, you know, sectors, energy, maybe even uh, sectors that are have been worst hit. You're going to have to adopt a modern monetary hyper Keynesian policy in order to do that. You're going to have to be very easy with the money supply that you print and the liquidity you inject. That will just have to become the way uh, world governments, the US government included, bails things out. So if that all comes to pass, what could happen, I think, is in the short run, things like stocks go down as they have been. There's economic uh, recession, uh, potentially. Crypto, I think, will take a hit. Look, it's a risk on asset right now. But on the other side of that, where you have governments that are essentially having to you know, print cash 
to bail out particular industries. I think on the other side of that, this bankless world that we've been talking about maybe has a, a resurgence and becomes uh, more important in the economy and maybe starts to live up to the potential of a safe haven asset in certain conditions. And one of those conditions is if central banks kind of lose a grip and lose restraint and uh, start printing a lot of money. So on the other side of this, you know, maybe there's some upside for crypto, but it could be a bit rocky until we hit that inflection point. And I, look, it's just one thought as of today. And uh, the only way to really see how this plays out is to wait and see. But I think what folks should be doing is thinking about how to position themselves for that type of uh, scenario as a possibility, as a probability, not panic, but position, you know, in order to come out on the right side of that. One thing that is an interesting question, right, you, is there was often this idea that, okay, Bitcoin could be this hedge, this protection, this, you know, the notion of digital gold has often been used. Now, it doesn't tend to behave like that in times of like, you know, real volatility or instability so far, maybe at some point it will. Do you see kind of Ether in the same way? Do you think this Ether becoming at some point, yes, this kind of digital gold? Both Ether and, and Bitcoin I see as, as, as a new type of commodity money, algorithmic protocol backed money. And um, both of them being at some point in the future, alternatives to store values that are found in, in the fiat system. So I would bucket them in, in the same category. Now, Ether is going to be a higher beta asset than uh, Bitcoin, right? So it's going to be a bit more risky. I would couple them in the same category. It's early for both of those assets in this type of scenario to be you know, safe haven assets at the outset. Probably not this one. Anyway, <laughs> we'll see what happens though. Is it just a question of size and kind of how widely sp spread they are or, or why is it early? Or what, what's going to change that they actually start acting like that? We need more economic bandwidth in the space. I think we need more applications in the space, more that you can do with your crypto. Right now, the population of people who own crypto is probably 50 million people-ish, you know, in that range. Population of people doing stuff with DeFi is like a small city, maybe 250K to be very generous. People actually, you know, using crypto systems and going bankless today, fully bankless. So we need many more people. We need much more capital, much more liquidity. We need a better banking infrastructure, both, you know, exchanges and crypto banks and also money protocols. Mostly, I think we just need time. I think that a generation, you know, millennial generation is kind of growing up and crypto is kind of normal, you know, for us, right? If you ask millennials, you know, do you prefer Bitcoin or, or gold? They're going to pick the crypto, the digital asset, right? Because that's the world they grew up in. Well, you know, the generation behind us, Gen Z, even more so, you know, they were brought up in, in games like Fortnite, right? It's all digital currency. Some of this is going to take decades and generational shifts and that sort of thing. That's why for me, if you're in crypto and you're not, you're not doing the narrative thing where you're you know, flipping assets, getting in and out, it's, you have to have a long-term, decades-long perspective. When the internet came out, you know, people didn't immediately cancel their magazine subscriptions and start sending everything via email and you're not sending postcards, right? It took time. And they phased out of those old legacy systems over time. And uh, we had a new generation of, of digital natives on the other side of that. That took decades, right? It didn't all happen at once. So I think crypto will happen in a similar way. Um, we have an initial group of crypto natives that are going kind of, you know, bankless today, just sort of testing the system. There are alpha testers, if you will. It's not ready for mainstream. I can't drop my traditional bank accounts today. I would never do that. That'd be silly. It's not pragmatic to do that at this point in time. But more and more, these crypto natives are shifting into this new uh, crypto world. And as more people join us, as kind of the systems get better, then I think it'll just naturally happen. And at that point in time, then, you know, Bitcoin, Ether, they start to become safe haven assets, but not yet. We're not ready for that yet. They're still going to be highly volatile during a recession type of condition. It was really fantastic to speak with you. And I think it's an extremely exciting space. I think the work you're doing is really great in terms of educating people on how to actually use these products. Because 
that's going to be one of the big challenges and it's one of the important things to do. So yeah, we're going to, of course, have links to bank list so people can check that out, check out your newsletter. And tell us about your podcast that you just started. You know, it's kind of moving the bankless program into a podcast format. Um, some people learn better that way. I myself do. I've learned so much from from you guys over the years. Uh, you know, I think Epicenter has, has been part of onboarding me. So I feel like this is kind of, you know, the second generation, of, you know, folks that you've onboarding uh, are doing this stuff. But the bankless podcast, it's just about folks on the journey of going bankless. So using crypto systems in real life as their bank account, like tactics, opportunities. Uh, right now, we're, we're starting things off with kind of defining what it means to go bankless and starting with the, the money layer and work our way upwards so people have a framework for how to understand this stuff. And uh, we publish every every week, so every Monday. So there'll be a new episode out. And I'm super excited about it. My co-host is um, David Hoffman, uh, who's great. Who's also been on the podcast. Yeah, it's just fun. The reason I'm doing this is, is because I think that not enough people are talking about this, right? And I feel like this is core and central to crypto. Bankless, right? It's not just about Bitcoin price appreciation. It's about a new money, bankless money system. I'm just passionate about it. And um, everything else is boring in comparison. Well, I definitely agree there. All right. Well, thanks a lot for joining us today. Thanks, Sebastian. Thanks, Brian. It's been fun. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have a Google Home or Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Epicenter podcast. Go to epicenter.tv slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for the newsletter so you get new episodes in your inbox as they're released. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we're always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.